In a massive departure from WWE Raw, SmackDown actually continued to give us compelling storylines and interesting characters and time on the show for women. Meanwhile, Edge clearly hasn't recovered from that time Becky Lynch accidentally turned him heel on SmackDown's 1000th show. For all this and more, I am Tom Collihue and you are watching the SmackDown Review. Be sure to click like, subscribe if you haven't, and let's get started. The show opened with a near 5 minute recap of what had happened weeks before. Smackdown needs to stop doing this, we actually watch the show, don't keep reminding us what we haven't seen because we've seen it. Shortly after that Edge came down to the ring to cut a typical Edge promo now in that he repeated himself slightly but with increased momentum as he did so and this really was him embracing his newly heel persona or at least a return to the heel persona that he became a top guy while wearing. The announced team mentioned that the main event tonight would be a street fight between Daniel Bryan and Jey Uso. Initially, I was just a little bit weary about this. However, with the way that they've set it up, it really played into the idea that Edge and in fact Roman Reigns were out for blood and out to take the opportunity to take Daniel Bryan out of the equation, Jey Uso simply there as a spoiler. This would play out across the night with Edge meeting up with Adam Pearce and Sonya Deville backstage to say that he would be at ringside, Paul Heyman encouraging a little bit of carnage in Edge's eyes and in fact a brief meeting with Adam Pearce and Paul Heyman as well. This was our recurring thread throughout the night and it made for very interesting TV because it continued to crank up the pressure on a main event that would deliver. Dolph Ziggler and Otis, as we know are the best of friends, were on the same team as Robert Roode and Chad Gable against Dominic and Rey Mysterio and the Street Profits. Again, we have seen this match a couple of weeks ago. The Heels won that one. The Heels also won this one. It wasn't really much of a match. Gable continued to look like the fall guy for his team. Meanwhile, Otis has continued to get the strongest push of any one of these eight. So it could well be that we see him next week lifting a SmackDown Championship over his head for the first time, just a SmackDown Tag Team Championship, and not with Tucker, which is baffling in the extreme. However, that said, next week we will get the Four Corner SmackDown Tag Team Championship match, and my suspicion is that Dominic and Rey Mysterio will be walking away with the gold. Seth Rollins and Cesaro had a segment next, Seth Rollins coming down to the ring in one of the most ridiculous suits I've ever seen. This was a really good night for ridiculous suits. Corey Graves played his part, Sami Zayn looked wonderful in a gold and black suit that just looked so magnificently stupid, and Sonya Deville of course was the greatest suit wearer in the history of wrestling. I didn't expect that I would be rating suits tonight and yet here I am. Cesaro sung about the swing, Seth Rollins refused to be swung. I get the feeling that Wrestlemania we will set a new record for people who've been swung about. Seth Rollins who chose to work with Cesaro really wants to break that record. The pair did not get physical, there was no further swinging, which I think is necessary now. We've seen them get physical, we've seen them cut promos. This was an opportunity for Cesaro to cut his metal and really show what he could do with a microphone. Unfortunately for me, he didn't quite hit what I was looking for. That said, this particular match still has the potential to steal the show at WrestleMania, and I'm excited to see what they can deliver. This is a big opportunity for Cesaro, and I don't think Seth Rollins will be out of the title picture for too long, so Cesaro needs to take advantage of this as much as he can. Shayna Baszler's losing streak in singles matches was extended to six when she lost in less than a minute to Natalia. Natalia. This was to serve a purpose, essentially, of throwing together all of the available women's tag teams with the idea that Night One will feature a Four Corners women's tag team match, the winner then going on to face the tag team champions of Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler at WrestleMania's second night. My suspicion is that Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose will be winning that match and taking the women's tag team championships, not because they can actually beat Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, but because Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler implode over the fact that Shayna Baszler cannot win a match. Just kidding, it's all about Reginald. Billy Kay was on TV, so was Carmella. No Bailey though. Logan Paul arrived, essentially wearing a smart casual version of the rather extreme suit that Sami Zayn was wearing. This particular segment, straddling the second hour draw segment, really showed how WWE planned to use Logan Paul going into WrestleMania. His work here was subtle, quite understated, not overpowering, 
Also, it was clear that while Sami Zayn knew what he was going to say, Logan Paul was not fully aware of what he was going to say. My suspicion is that Logan Paul has been scripted, whereas Sami Zayn was allowed to ad-lib and create as he went. This segment was essentially spent with Logan Paul being confused by Sami Zayn, but willing to stand in Sami Zayn's corner at WrestleMania. Sami Zayn showed a trailer for his new documentary, which showed no evidence of any wrongdoing on anybody's part, and then he took a stunner from Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens would push Logan Paul out of the way as he walked out. That was one of two times that Logan Paul played tough guy. Sami Zayn backed down, Kevin Owens did not. Come WrestleMania, Logan Paul will attract a lot of young fans, and they want those young fans to be looking at Kevin Owens. I think by the end of it, Sami Zayn will be knocked out by Logan Paul. Keep your eyes here, if that's exactly what happens. Bianca Belair beat Carmella clean on Carmella's return to TV within about five minutes. This is a match that was originally planned for Elimination Chamber or Fastlane. Elimination Chamber, I believe, was the original plan. The idea being that Carmella, who had recently been pushed against Sasha Banks, could put over Bianca Belair and really make her look strong. However, the WWE then decided, oh no, Reginald's a better plan. Yeah. It's baffling to me the way that the WWE use Carmella. They bring her back to TV with a reinvention, a recreation. She goes up against a top talent, loses, and then goes off TV again and rinse and repeat. After a while, with all the flip-flopping of face heel turns for Carmella, maybe it's time to sit down and ask yourself, is this really working? Just pick a consistent character and let her go. Carmella is a former SmackDown Women's Champion. Let her do what she is good at. It's that simple. Sasha Banks did try to attack Bianca Belair from behind again, but Bianca was wise to it this time. Didn't seem particularly angry with Sasha either, showing a more friendly side of the competition. That is exactly what I expected if you watch my preview shows over on Twitch as well. This has to get more physical, but we can't have anyone looking dumb. This one is going to go for a while. Now that we are post-Reginald, Sasha Banks vs Bianca Belair is a lot more fun and a lot more interesting. I'm excited with what they've delivered here. Apollo Crews challenged Big E to a Nigerian drum fight. No, I don't know either. Our main event was a street fight between Jey Uso and Daniel Bryan. Jey Uso, who next week will feature in the Battle Royal after an incredible year. A real shame for him to knock it onto the main WrestleMania card. Well, either of them, to be completely honest. However, this was a good match. Jey Uso was dominant for most of it, using a chair and assorted weaponry to keep his place on top. However, he would eventually be forced to tap out to Daniel Bryan's yes lock. Daniel Bryan afterwards would immediately go on the attack, hitting Edge as Edge sat on commentary and then running up the ramp to where Roman sat in his chair. Roman would throw the chair at Daniel Bryan in the Braun Strowman style, however Bryan would catch him and on the ramp would lock in the yes lock, would not convince him to tap, instead Roman went for the pass out motion. Daniel Bryan standing tall this week after Edge stood tall last week, Roman Reigns undoubtedly will stand tall next week. Very classic triple threat booking. 50, 50, 50. Yes, I know that's 150. Bear with me. It's WWE. Smackdown this week kept it simple and kept it safe, but ultimately delivered everywhere they needed to. The triple threat match does not need any real build. We're all quite excited for it, so just let us get to that point. They're being quite clever with it, showing tension between individuals rather than tension between the three as a group. After this, I do expect Cesaro to take on Roman Reigns, who will remain the champion, and Edge to face off with Daniel Bryan going forwards. They very much established that as a feud. We're also seeing a real hone down when it comes to Sasha and Bianca Belair. They're not screwing around, they're not messing about. Same can be said of Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Despite the distraction of Logan Paul, Logan Paul was only used to further a storyline here, much like Bad Bunny has been over on Raw. The celeb choices have been very good from WWE this year. Finally, we did see a build towards matches that we do need to see on the WrestleMania card, whether kickoff show or not. That being the big four corner women's tag match and the big four corner men's tag match for the championships. Things are still moving forward and that's a very good thing. We even got a promo from Baron Corbin about the fact that he's going to be on Raw. Busy man, busy man. Let me know what you thought of SmackDown down in the comments. Be sure to click like on this video. I've been Tom Collihue and thank you very much for watching.